This program is brought to you in part by... No matter what goes on in the rest of the world, the keys will always be unaffected. The Florida Keys and Key West. And by the following... Flagler, a Coral Gables-based commercial real estate company. The Florida East Coast Railway essentially was Henry Flagler Railway. The idea of building this great railroad, along with the building of the Panama Canal, this was just part of what we as Americans did. We did great things. There was such optimism in the air. I think people really thought that they could do anything they dreamed. What Flagler did was simply an extension of his and the country's greatness. He saw himself as part of America's destiny, as a critical player. He invested his fortune in the development of the East Coast of Florida. But it was pretty risky. Not too many people were in a position to take that kind of risk. The work was so tough. Most men didn't last more than a few months. It was never easy. This was a time when labor was at war with capital. The Key West newspapers are saying basically our only hope of ever having a railroad rests with Henry Flagler. The Titanic was being built and the Panama Canal was being constructed, but within our shores, this was the most important thing. Everyone who was involved in it believed it, thought it could be done. They were going to make it. There simply had never been anything like it attempted in U.S. or world history. More than two decades after the last spike was driven to complete the Transcontinental Railway in 1869, the vast Florida wilderness was America's last frontier. The nation was flourishing from the Atlantic to the Pacific, yet Florida remained almost as remote from civilization as the heart of Africa. Miami was a virtual outpost of a thousand people. A couple thousand people in Jacksonville, Tampa with 4,000. Key West had 22,000 people at the time. It was a thriving naval station, coaling center, turtling and fishing capitals, center of cigar making, far more important than any place else in Florida and an important U.S. port. Here we were uh, approaching the beginning of the 20th century and a major city like Key West existed and you couldn't get to it except by boat, imagine that. The first railroad in America ran in 1830, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. But as early as 1836, an article appeared in a journal or a magazine or a newspaper at the time propounding a railroad to Key West. Now this was incredible. Florida was uninhabited, essentially, and yet this idea of a railroad going to Key West would continue on through the decades. Only a few people believed that Florida was anything more than a tangled wilderness. One of them was Henry Morrison Flagler, a successful New York businessman searching for a challenge. Flagler saw Florida as a land filled with opportunity, waiting to be connected to the developing nation. Henry Flagler was an interesting character because he started off in a very humble family. But he was very industrious and uh, he was making money and he became a partner in Standard Oil. And of course, that was the most successful company and he and Rockefeller were very, very, very successful. Politicians attacked Standard Oil. The corporation was under investigation by the state of New York 
and the U.S. government. John D. Rockefeller and Henry Flagler were called to testify in antitrust cases. And this was very frustrating to Flagler. He did not like the government interfering in what he considered his private business affairs. And of course, the, the preeminent trust buster of the day was Theodore Roosevelt, who became president in 1901. A few years later, when Roosevelt was going off to Africa to hunt lions, uh, Henry Flagler writes, uh, I wish good hunting to the lions. So uh, Henry Flagler was no friend of Teddy Roosevelt because Teddy Roosevelt was an enemy of Standard Oil. Flagler was 53 when he retired from the day-to-day -day operations of the corporation. Yet dividends from his company stocks continued to surge like an uncapped oil well. More than enough to fuel his interest in finding a new challenge. Flagler could see what was happening in Florida. He lived on Fifth Avenue in New York City. And one of his neighbors was Henry B. Plant. And Henry Plant was a railroad builder in the South and was extending his railroads down the peninsula of Florida. Flagler invested money in Plant's corporation at first, so that must have given him uh, some experience and some ideas about the potential of Florida. And he decided in the winter of 1885 that he would build a hotel in St. Augustine. Not just an ordinary big wood frame resort hotel, which was typical of the days, but rather to build, well, to build the best resort hotel in the world. My hardest problem was the Ponce de Leon, said Flagler. How to build a hotel to meet the requirements of 19th century America and yet be in keeping with the character of the place. Architects Thomas Hastings and John Carrere designed the hotel like a Spanish castle, a perfect fit with old St. Augustine. Tiffany glass, murals painted by George Menard, woodwork by Patier and Stymus, and gilded plaster moldings grace the rotunda. The Hotel Ponce de Leon was the wonder of its day. But Flagler didn't stop there. He built another hotel, the Alcazar, with a huge pool and therapeutic baths. He purchased a third hotel, the Cordova, then set about enhancing St. Augustine paving the streets, building Memorial Church, a hospital and city hall, and most importantly, improving the railroad. The Jacksonville, St. Augustine and Halifax River Railroad was a ramshackle narrow gauge train running from Jacksonville to St. Augustine with a ferry crossing on the St. Johns River. A streak of rust and a right-of-way, declared Flagler. The train carried building materials and guests bound for Flagler's hotels, but often arrived late or not at all due to outmoded equipment and chronic breakdowns. On December 31st, 1885, he purchased lock, stock, and barrel, track ties, and all equipment that railroad. On that day, Henry Flagler was in the railroad business, not because he wanted to or had any intention of becoming a great railroad magnet, but because he had no choice. It was from that purchase of that 30-mile railroad that Henry Flagler would become one of the great railroad entrepreneurs in American history. Like the legend of Juan Ponce de Leon, Flagler came to Florida looking for a fountain of youth. He found it in his second career as a hotel and railroad developer. Often Henry Plant is talked about as have, have, 
doing a similar thing on the West Coast. But the truth is that Henry Plant wasn't investing his own money. He managed to find backers, among them Henry Walters and Henry Flagler, helped bankroll his expansions in Florida. Flagler and Plant sat down one day on Mr. Plant's yacht and in a private meeting made an agreement. And that agreement was, we're not gonna put it in writing, but we're not gonna make the terrible mistakes that people like Gould and Harriman uh, and Morgan and Vanderbilt made in building the railroads of the Northeast and building the railroads of the West, where people are shooting each other trying to cross their railroad lines. We are going to agree that Henry Flagler, you will stay on the East Coast, Henry Plant, you will stay on the West Coast, and we'll be good friends, we'll be friendly competitors for Florida business, but we're not going to impede on each other's territory. Flagler's Florida East Coast Railway had a provision in its charter, allowing it to build further south into the Daytona Beach area. It was becoming clear that the weather in South Florida was more dependably tropical than St. Augustine's winter freezes. And along the way were untapped business opportunities. In Flagler's mind, extending the railroad south was inevitable. But it was pretty risky. It was pretty worthless land unless his railroad succeeded in bringing in the commerce and the settlers that they hoped it would. And, uh, not too many people were in a position to take that kind of risk. Flagler acquired smaller railroads, then linked them to his own tracks as he expanded the Florida East Coast Railway down the peninsula. At Lake Worth and Palm Beach, he developed two communities and built the world's largest hotel, the Royal Poinciana. Flagler bought the Palm Beach Inn and turned it into a second resort, the Breakers. Henry Flagler was thinking about things in a very big way from very early on. And within a few years of his building Hotel Ponce de Leon, his vision was freely for the whole peninsula of Florida and the Bahamas and Cuba. Long before he even got to Palm Beach, he was thinking about building a railroad to Key West and had locked up his options so he could do just such a thing if he ever had the opportunity. Flagler's vice president, Joseph R. Parrott, directed the railway's extension and the birth of entire towns like West Palm Beach, Fort Lauderdale, and Miami. From the verandas of Flagler's five-story Royal Palm Hotel, guests enjoyed panoramas of Biscayne Bay and the Miami River. FEC rails penetrated the farmland of the Lower Peninsula, creating an agricultural industry and a settlement named Homestead. I really think he saw himself in the way a lot of 19th century Americans uh, of his uh, ilk saw themselves as sort of the crossroads of destiny and history and really hoping that he'd have an opportunity to make some contribution to demonstrate that America was taking its rightful place in history and in the world. I think it was actually Mark Twain that coined the phrase, the Gilded Age. And the Gilded Age meant that people had more time and they had more money and they were able to accomplish things that they hadn't really been able to accomplish before. And when Henry Flagler built Whitehall for his third wife, he spared no expense. And it was as gracious and as beautiful a home as any castle. Life was full of enthusiasm and the technology was changing so fast. I mean, it's hard for us to think about now in the 21st century when it seems like things are moving faster than ever before, but in the beginning of the 20th century, there were so many more important discoveries and so many more projects that had never been attempted before, like the Panama Canal or Flagler's Railroad.
and people thought it could be done, and in fact it could. Flagler knew that trains were the key to development, and he invested widely in railroads, including a system in Cuba. He envisioned huge ferries carrying entire trains between Havana and Key West, completing a through rail route linking Cuba with New York. With the passage of the Panama Canal Purchase Act in 1902, it looked certain that the United States would complete the canal linking the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. Flagler saw the opportunity he had been waiting for and summoned his engineers. Henry Flagler commissioned a number of studies, and those studies said that if the railroad was extended to the nearest deep water port, Miami was not a deep water port at that time, that all of those ships coming through the newly to be built Panama Canal would head for the nearest deep water American port. And so the studies showed that that nearest deep water American port would be at Cape Sable on Florida's southwest coast. Flagler's engineer, William J. Crome, and his survey party battled sawgrass, marsh, and mosquitoes to map a direct route across the Everglades to Cape Sable, a journey through territory he described as a most godforsaken region. And when they came back, somewhere five and a half to six months later, almost devoid of clothing, without any of their instruments, all that Mr. Chrome had been able to salvage were his notebooks, thank goodness. And they were so weak that they had to be helped up on the train. And when Mr. Chrome recovered and he came in to see Mr. Flagler and Mr. Flagler said to him, well, Mr. Chrome, uh, what do you have to say? What do you think? Mr. Chrome said, Mr. Flagler, there is not enough fill on the face of the earth to build a railroad across the Everglades. And with that, the people of Key West were simply overjoyed because they knew that their time had come. Key West Harbor was the next closest deep water port. In January of 1904, Parrott sent engineer Chrome to survey the route from Homestead to Key Largo, then continue all the way down to Key West. A long bad job in mosquito time, wrote Chrome in his diary. It will be a hard trip, but I am glad to be back at work again. Construction engineer Joseph Carroll Meredith had just completed a half mile long concrete pier at Tampico Harbor in Mexico. His success with difficult projects was well known throughout the railroad and construction industries. Flagler needed a chief engineer for the Key West extension project and called Meredith for a meeting. Flagler was looking for a man who believed uh, this could be done and who had the expertise to be able to do it engineering wise and in Meredith he found his man. Chief Engineer Meredith delivered his construction studies to Flagler. Let's get to work, he told Meredith. I want to see it done before I die. To accomplish the 128 mile long Key West extension, Meredith had to solve the problem of moving men and equipment through marshes, mangroves, and open stretches of ocean. Chief Engineer Meredith's first test was building a railroad embankment from Homestead to Key Largo. No one had ever dared to lay tracks across 20 miles of Everglades. His solution was to outfit four barges with cranes and shovels. Two barges started out near Homestead, traveling south. Two more began at Jewfish Creek near Key Largo, heading north until they all met in the middle. The dredges dug parallel canals, scooping the mud onto an embankment between them. Then floating forward, the digging was repeated. 
As soon as the embankment dried, the rails were spiked in place. In November of 1906, the first locomotive rolled off a barge and onto the tracks to help move men and materials. On Key Largo, rows of tents were staked out in a camp for men who were blasting the bedrock and carving a right-of-way through the hardwood jungle. At times, the construction would demand as many as 4,000 men working around the clock. The workforce ran the gamut from skilled equipment operators to machinists, to carpenters and cooks, to construction divers, and a steady stream of laborers working with picks, shovels, and wheelbarrows. Recruiting enough workers was a never-ending task. They went so far as to advertise in Europe. They brought in Scandinavians. They brought in Swedes. Uh, they brought in people from the United States. They brought in people from the Bahamas, essentially putting to work as many people as they could find. Everything I read about Henry Flagler, the people that worked for him, how they felt about him, he was a good man. And there were often reports about, oh, workers were recruited in New York when they first got off the boats from Ireland or Spain or Italy. They had no idea what they were getting into because it was very difficult work. But Henry Flagler treated them well. And he did have a wonderful support organization so people were well cared for. A lot of them liked it better than some of the labor jobs elsewhere. This was a time when they were building the subway systems in New York City. And some of the laborers had moved down from New York City to labor jobs, and they liked the keys a whole lot better. It wasn't wet, cold, and dark. It was a real challenge. And sometimes you got guys who were lying around doing not much of anything who were lured by unscrupulous labor recruiters who said, oh, geez, come down to paradise and work and, and make good money. And they, they got down to paradise and found out that it was 95 degrees and the humidity just as high and the mosquitoes as thick as clouds and uh, that every mile that the railway pushed away from Miami was one more mile further away from civilization. <laughs> Those were pretty daunting conditions. There was a suit brought against Flagler alleging unfair labor practices and unreasonable labor practices, but it was dismissed summarily in district court because it was proven that, yeah, it was tough work, but nobody was keeping any slaves. Drill gangs opened holes for dynamite and blasted the bedrock into pieces. Men worked 10-hour days and six-day weeks moving tons of rock to fill railroad trestles and build embankments as high as 10 feet above sea level. Mule-drawn wagons hauled rock from quarries on Key Largo, Plantation Key, and Windley's Key. Dredges and steam-powered pumps moved sand and rock to build causeways that extended the tracks to Lower Matacumbi. Throughout the Keys, FEC projects were constructed in sections and then joined when completed. The next great challenge was the Long Key Viaduct, a structure that would bridge more than two miles of open water between Long Key and Conch Key. By October of 1906, Meredith and his engineers had met every test of their skills with ingenuity and determination. But while workers prepared the right-of-way on Long Key, nature fought back. 
Living quarters and mess halls were on board two-story houseboats called quarter boats. Railroad management made a decision that in the event of a hurricane, the safest place for the men would be inside the securely moored quarter boats. The poor souls who in 1906 were told, you're going to be safe on the quarter boats, and then were subjected to these winds of 150 and 160 miles an hour, and then felt the quarter boats being ripped away from their moorings, and all of a sudden they realized that the quarter boats are breaking apart, and they're 8, 10, 12 miles out in the water, and the water is 15, 18, 22 feet high in terms of the waves. Nobody could survive that. It was a tragic lesson for the Florida East Coast Railway. From then on, the men would be sheltered on land. Flagler and his men were determined to continue the project to Key West. As workers were reorganized and the storm-damaged tracks were repaired, Chief Engineer Meredith remarked, no man who cannot stand grief should be connected with this enterprise. Tracks reached the Matacumi Keys in June of 1907, where the FEC established central supply to stockpile materials for construction of a long key viaduct. Supply trains delivered sand and limestone from central and southern Florida. Steel and coal arrived by rail from the northern states. Granite rock was shipped from as far away as Maine. The first thing you need to realize when building a railroad across the ocean is everything has to be brought there. There were no resources in the Keys initially for them to use. There was no fresh water, which they're going to need for driving their steam engines, uh, for mixing with their concrete. Every drop of water had to be brought down. They had barges with huge tanks on them. They'd bring it down from halfway up the Everglades. Mississippi paddle wheel steamers moved supplies and equipment in the shallow waters of the Florida Keys, where most vessels ran aground. One disheartened boat captain called it, not quite enough water for swimming and too much for farming. The Long Key Viaduct was designed with concrete piers and arched spans 50 feet in length. Tracks were set on top of the arches 30 feet above the water. In order to build a bridge, first you've got to put piers in the water. They did this by first setting coffer dams, which are wooden forms that have no bottom. They're just sitting there in the water and they're full of water. They poured the first level of concrete right in the bottom of these coffer dams, right under water. When the concrete sets, they can pump the water out of the coffer dam and climb in the hole that they've made in the water and build the forms that they need for the rising pier. The pier comes out, clears the top of the water, and then they can actually take the coffer dam away at that point on all the forms. Then the pier is ready for the next step, which is putting spans across the piers. Carpenters built wooden arch forms and sidewalls for the spans, then hoisted them into place with steam-powered derricks. Steel rods built into each lower pier section secured the bonds with the upper arch when the cement mixers went to work. Enormous quantities of imported marine concrete were poured to create 180 arches. It was a costly and time-consuming project, but on January 22, 1908,